Uh, James, my British supply. Well, that video I was doing half it got dumped out, so we're going to keep on going here. Uh, okay, so question and answer. Sarah Ann, she has a seven month old 18 pound puppy and she wants to know if that's too small to breed. Um, so the answer is no, which is 18 pounds at seven months. She's going to be like 22 pounds when she's fully grown and uh, that's not an issue at all, it's fine. But let's talk a little bit about sizes of dogs. So somebody else has asked me, do we breed uh, micros? And so I'm gonna kind of put these two things together here. So what's a micro? So that's a good question. I mean, a micro is, uh, you know, any dog that is less than maybe 15 pounds, 14 pounds fully grown, I would consider to be a micro. So, you know, what's the low end? I don't know, 10 pounds is an awfully small Frenchie. I guess they're out there. I'm not sure I've ever seen a 10 pound fully grown Frenchie, but they probably exist. And certainly something that's in that 16 pound range, that I would consider to be potentially a micro. And a dog that's 17 pounds to 22 pounds, those are the dogs that I love. I love those size dogs, that's what we try to produce. And then there are dogs that are in that 22 to you know, 30 pound range. And uh, well, let's just go about 20, 27 by the way is the breed standard, 27 pound. And then you've got those 28 to you know, 35 pounds. So these are giants. Uh, some people love those. I mean, hey, it's all about what you want to breed. I mean, you know, if you want big Frenchies, then I mean, you know, fine. Um, so this one here, we see lots of that. This one here is the questionable one. So um, if you're breeding to the show ring and you produce dogs that are over 28 pounds, then they're not going to go in the show ring because a breed standard maximum weight is 27 pounds. If you've got a 28, 35 pound girl, breed her to a small male. I've got some males that are 16, 17 pounds and breed to a dog like that and get the size down, at least on some of the puppies. Um, you know, this one here, fine. Just breed that to what, you know, if you want to get down this side, breed to a smaller dog. If you want to get up this size, then breed to a larger dog. I love this. I mean, I've got lots of dogs that range in, in studs that range from a low end of 16 to a high end of about 23 pounds and they tend to produce puppies in that range. I like that, that solution myself. But this one here, look, if you've got a 10 pound dog, I wouldn't be breeding, and I think you're asking for trouble. If you've got a 16 pound dog, breed that to another 16, 17 pound dog, and you probably have good results. Don't breed that to a 30 pound dog. I think that's asking for problems. You know, we're having a C-section, so we're not gonna go through labor, we're not gonna go through whelp, and that avoids a lot of the complications. But still, a little bitty 12-pound dog that's got six puppies in it is gonna be huge, and that could be just pretty stressing on that, on that dog. So I would not be doing that. Cut off, I think, is something around 16 pounds. I think much smaller than that. I think you need to think twice about it. And if you're gonna breed a dog that's that small, don't breed that dog on its but it's just a year old. Wait till that dog's at least a year and a half old and a couple of, a couple of heats before you even attempt that. Okay, Elizabeth Garner asks about the wire crate that she'd seen in one of our videos for our puppies and she wants to know where you get that wire crate. Well, what is wire floor rather? Well, what we do is we buy a playpen, buy a playpen. They're about, they're about 250 bucks on like Chewy. And you can buy it as either a four foot by four foot, which is what we use most of the time, or a three by three. And you wanna get the half inch uh, wire spacing, otherwise it's too big for their paws. And basically what this is, is it has a raised floor about a foot from the regular floor with some trays underneath. So the puppies are on this raised floor and when they poop and pee, it goes down through the wire grate onto the floor down below. And so they're not walking around in their own mess and it works pretty well. So that's what that is. Dean asks, have you heard of a blue fawn? Well, yeah, absolutely. Blue fawn is not an unusual dog to see at all. A blue fawn is a little d, little d dog that is A-Y-A-Y and does not have brindle. That is a blue fawn dog. And then they ask if you make that with a blue brindle, what will we get? So here's our blue dog. We're assuming this is also A-Y-A-Y. And this dog is then K-B-M, one copy of brindle. What do you get? Well, you get all blue dogs that are all A-Y-A-Y, of which half of them are K-B-N, brindles, and half of them don't. These are blue brindles, so you get a half blue brindles, and you get a half fawns. 
Blue horns, I think of that. Blue horns, half blue horns. Half blue horns. So that's what you get on that breed. Uh, CE asks, says, I have a mural with red eye glow. Is my dog a chocolate mural? Yeah, well, this is an interesting one here because if you take the mural out of the equation, any dog that produces a red eye glow in a dark room with your video phone, taking a, taking a video with your camera with the light on your camera, don't just take a snapshot, you've got to take a video. If it has a demonic red eye glow, not just a flashing little second of eye with some other colors in there, but it has a red eye glow just about all the time, that dog is a chocolate dog. That dog is either little b, little b, or it's little co, little co. And I mean, I have never ever seen a dog that had a red eye glow that wasn't Meryl, that, that, didn't, that had a red eye glow that didn't test that way. So I'm convinced that happens every time. Some people are gonna tell you differently, but I'm convinced that I've never ever seen Let's put it this way. I mean, sometimes you don't see the red eye glow on a dog that's just three weeks when its eyes are open to as much as three months. You might not see the red eye glow. But I have never, ever seen a dog that I tested chocolate, I knew it was chocolate, that didn't have a red eye glow at three months or older. Okay. The problem with Merle is, Merle dogs tend to have a red eye glow regardless of whether they're chocolate or not. So the test does not work for Merle's. If you see a Merle with a red eye glow, it doesn't mean anything. Purple Heart says, hey, Purple Heart, if you've, if you've served for us, we appreciate that. Sounds like you are even wounded doing that for us, so we, take a, we, we say thank you. He has, or he or she, has a lilac and tan. So here we go, lilac and tan, little d, little d, little b, little b. Lilac and tan, A-T, A-T. That could be an A-T, A, the same thing of producer lilac and tans. Uh, bred to a merle and tan. So here's our merle, didn't say it's blue, didn't say it's chocolate did say it had tan points and incidentally since these are tan dogs we know that they don't have brindle we know they don't have brindle and this dog here is a merle and this dog is not merle what do you get well you get all blue carriers you get all chocolate carriers you get all with tan points, of which uh, some of them will not show it because they're probably fawns, of which none of them are brindle. And half of them are merles and half of them aren't. So there you go. You get a litter of fawn merles and fawns. All have tan points, but the tan points might not show up very much because it's a fawn dog. Well, uh, actually that's rubbish. It's not a fawn dog. <laughs> it might be a black and tan, actually. I'm not sure, I think that's gonna be a black and tan, actually. I think you're gonna get black. Excuse me, I'm gonna change that. Since it's not a, an AYAY, -A -A it's an ATAT, -T, but it doesn't have blue, this is a black and tan, and this is a black and tan metal. So you get black and tans and black and tan metals. All right, we got it right, finally. Uh, Jennifer Mims, uh, I replied to this on that last video when we were in the car, but she's, I'm just gonna explain this a bit more. She's talking about Pied, and she was being told by some people that a dog with one copy of Pied will be, could be a Pied dog, not in my world. That is never a Pied dog. The only way you get a Pied dog is that. You have to get an SS. It has to have two copies of Pied to be a Pied dog. Now you can get confused if that dog's literally, literally cream, you won't know it's a pied dog. And a pied dog can be what's called an extreme pied. It can look completely white. There's just the tiniest little bit of color somewhere that might not show up until they are two, three months old, but it's an extreme pied. But it still will test SS. Um, but I have never seen a pied dog that is, is SM. Never seen it. I just don't, this just doesn't happen. It's a, it's a double recessive gene. You have to have two copies. One from each parent has to give out the S gene to produce a pied dog. And then she goes on to ask about Irish Pied. So an Irish Pied, and I have a guy called Rumble who's an Irish Pied, he's a very pretty boy. So what is his mark is, is he has red, white socks, and he has a, a, a red saddle over his back, and he has a red ring, and then he has, he's double hooded, he has red on both sides of his face with a white stripe down the middle. That's an Irish Pied. She wants to know how you get an Irish Pied. Well, if you breed an Irish Pied to an Irish Pied, I think you'll get Irish Pieds. Other than doing that, I don't know uh, I think it's the luck of the draw. I don't know how you're going to get an Irish pride. Sorry. Catherine asks, 
third dog came back as a test like that, what is it? Well, that's a moral. One copy of them, because a dominant gene like, like Brindle produced a moral dog. That is a moral dog. Again, some moral dogs, you don't hardly see it anywhere on them. You just see a little bit maybe on their muzzle, and you find out when you test them that they're morals. Some dogs come back as a test as moral, and you see no moral on them anywhere. That's what's called a cryptic moral. And incidentally, you never breed a moral to a moral, but you can breed a cryptic moral to a moral, and you run a very small chance of running into problems. I think it's something like 3%, so it's, you could probably take that risk. You never breed a moral to a moral. That will run you into troubles a uh, quarter of the time, where you could have some real problems with deafness and, and, and blindness. Uh, Kay says, she had a litter, she had a cleft palate. Do I do that breeding again? And she was advised by people to spay both dogs. Well, the first thing is, is that uh, uh, don't spay the dogs. Um, look, clefts do show up. Um, it's, I suspect it's a double recessive gene. It's got to be on both sides to even have it show up. If that is a true statement, then, well, the first thing is uh, cleft dogs have a hard time surviving. Typically, if it's much of a cleft, they can't suckle because they can't get a vacuum when they're sucking because there's a hole that goes up through their nose, through their sinuses. Those dogs, unless it's just a hair lip in the front, which can be fixed, and those dogs will survive. If it's a cleft that goes all a cleft that goes all the way back into the back of the roof of their mouth, they're probably not going to survive. You probably don't want to try and get them to survive. So a dog that produces a cleft, I suspect might be a, I'm going to call cleft, big a cleft is a little c. Now there's not a test for this. Don't, don't go off to animal genetics and say I need to have a a test for cleft palates, because then let's say James Chopping said there is one, there isn't one. There's a, well, there's a, I'm sure there's a gene for it, but we don't know where that gene is, and consequently we can't do a test for it. But I suspect, and I might be wrong, I suspect that a cleft palate is a recessive gene. And if you put two dogs together that have a cleft palate, you run into this risk of producing a, a, basically a quarter of the litter with cleft palates. If you do the Punnett square on this um, hypothetical situation, Remember, this is not proven, but if you had a dog that had one copy of cleft to a dog that had one copy of cleft, and what I said was true, you'd get a quarter of the dogs had no cleft palate gene at all, and you'd have a half the litter that would have one copy of the cleft. Sorry, this is supposed to be big C, little c. This is supposed to be big C, little c. So there's half of the litter. This, by the way, here it is. There's your clefts. So the quarter litter get both copies. And those ones potentially might show cleft. I see cleft palates occasionally. And I don't even, I mean, uh, here's, here's, the, here's my general advice to you. If you've had a good litter with great success, then why would you not repeat it? I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But if you have a problem like a cleft palate, or some other abnormal, abnormality in the puppies, then don't repeat the breeding. It doesn't mean that both dogs need to be spayed, but it does mean that probably a wise person would not breed those two dogs together. And so you take that girl who you suspect may have a problem, and you breed it with another unrelated stud, not related to the first stud you use with a problem, see what you get. If you get no clefts, fine, go on with it. If you keep on getting clefts, then maybe there's something going on with that girl, and maybe you need to think twice about breeding her. But I think just summarily say that you should uh, spay both the dogs. I, I don't think that's the right answer at all. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So uh, that's about it. So hey, thanks a lot for watching. We appreciate you. Um, if you like what we're doing, we'd like it if you subscribe to us. If you've got other questions you'd like answered, then drop us a line in the comment section. We'll get to those. And uh, you know, go check out www.mybreeder supply. We do sell a lot of products, the most of which we've actually uh, invented and patented and manufactured. And all of these things have been because of necessity. We've found a better way to do things and we now sell those products on MyBreeder supply, like our whelping kits, like our um, shipmate canister for shipping semen, like our incubators. Those are all products that we manufacture out of necessity for our own use, and I think that you'd find them very useful too. Um, hey, as always, thanks for watching, and uh, be nice to your doggies. Bye, everybody.